Harry Roberts. I've got to thank John for that. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Uh, so yeah, I'm Harry. My talk today is Architecting Scalable CSS. Um, I gave this talk about a month ago um, in the UK at um, industry conference, and someone tweeted this at me. If you can't read it, it says, Oi, Harry, the title of your talk, Industry Conf, uses one of my most hated words, architecting. Ugh, shudder. Like, people love to get annoyed at things on the internet. Um, so I was really surprised that someone <laughs> was pissed off at the title of my talk. So for him, we've got another title that he can use. Uh, um, so, oh, no one started any of my uh, timers, by the way. Um, I'll have to try and wing this one. Um, can I just, I've got to do my own time and look at this. Right. Um, yeah, so I'm Harry. Uh, that's me on top of a mountain trying to escape from email. Um, if you ask Mark, I am the worst person at email. I just, uh, I can't stand it. I'm no good at it. Um, I'm sort of a designery, developery type from the UK. Um, I've never really had an appropriate job title because I can't really do very much. Um, I can't really design very well, so I can't call myself a designer, really. Um, I don't know any JavaScript, so I'm not really a full-fledged front-end engineer. Um, I'm certainly not a programmer, so I've never really had an appropriate job title. I'm currently going with front-end architect, which seems to be working out OK. Uh, one thing I'm definitely not is a police-murdering serial killer. Now, this, <laughs> this is real. This is a, um, a front page of uh, the Daily Mirror. A UK sort of uh, newspaper. This is from the 60s. I actually share my name with this guy who uh, he is a serial killer. If you can't read that, it says, um, This is Harry Roberts. If you see him, tell the police. He is armed. He is dangerous. Um, I genuinely, like, he's a real guy. Uh, I'm also CSS Wizardry on the internet, a name that I picked years ago and I, know I can't stand. Um, if you find anything I talk about today remotely interesting, then um, that's the kind of place to go and look at really, really long articles about it. Uh, I also built Inuit CSS. Um, it's sort of a tiny, object-oriented, SaaS-based um, CSS framework. And, uh, and Inuit CSS has got scalability uh, built into its core. The whole point is that it's scalable. It's a tiny framework, but it can go from 1 to 1,000 pages in the blink of an eye. Um, so again, if you find anything I talk about today interesting, um, Inuit CSS, uh, it leads a lot of the things I talk about, and conversely, a lot of the things I talk and write about find their way back into Inuit. So it's on GitHub if you want to contribute, uh, feel free. It's uh, gaining a bit of traction at the moment. The, uh, the community around Inuit's getting bigger every day. It's really nice. Uh, as well as that, I work for Sky. Now, you've got Sky in Germany, right? You all know Sky? Cool. So. Um, I work at Sky as a, uh, a senior UI developer, which is, again, another completely useless job title because I can't write any JavaScript. I just, I just do CSS for these guys. Um, I moved to Sky two years ago, and I was sort of uh, 20 years old as a senior. And for me, this is a really exciting step. Um, Sky have got offices based in Leeds, where I'm from, which I didn't even know about until they got in touch with me. And I went in, and uh, yeah, they were always 20 years old, so only a couple of years of actual industry experience behind me, uh, going for this senior role, and I was super excited. You know, I couldn't wait to get there. It was going to be really exciting, uh, really interesting. But then, uh, sort of in the run-up to actually starting, I started to really panic because I'd never worked on a project as big as Sky before. Like the sites they make, like um, I built skybet.com, which I don't know if you've, you will be aware of out here. But um, it's one of Sky's most profitable websites. It's, well, it's actually their most profitable website. And I moved there to be their, their one front end guy. I work with sort of 50 software engineers, and I'm the one front end guy. So I started to really panic. Um, I went from being really excited, looking forward to it, to just thinking, shit, like, how am I supposed to do this? I've never done this before. Um, so I started to slow things down a bit. And um, I had the idea to like, just break things down. Um, I, did, I, just, I just did a Google search for break it down, and I was hoping to find some sort of a Sugar Hill Gang kind of break it down. 
but we got some nine-year-old girl break dancing. But that's fine. Uh, breaking things down is um, it's just a common sense approach to almost any big task. Um, and who's got a mortgage, if you've got a mortgage, you'll pay things back slowly. You'll pay back smaller amounts over a longer time. You break things down. If you do any spring cleaning, you don't clean the house, you clean the bathroom, then you clean the kitchen. Um, a lot of problems, I think, in web development can be solved just by a common sense approach. You don't necessarily need to be a good developer. You just need to have good, strong logic. You need to think about what you're doing. And, and breaking things down is one of the simplest ways to easily start big tasks. Um, quite an old analogy that Nicole Sullivan came up with is to treat code a bit like Lego. Um, you've probably all heard this analogy before, probably from myself or Nicole or, or someone talking about front-end architecture. But it's a really good analogy. If you imagine a big bucket of Lego, uh, you could build the Eiffel Tower. Um, and you could take the same blocks, you could take them apart, and you could build uh, the Tower of London or the Sydney Opera House. You know, these same boring little bits of plastic can be recombined in so many different ways. You can make such a variety of things out of them. And if you treat code the same way, you'll find that by breaking your code down, um, you can build such a vast array of things. Uh, instead of thinking, I've got to build a giant website, start thinking, well, first, I've got to build a home page. And as part of that home page, I have to build a masthead or a, you know, a, a carousel or, a, or a, an accordion. Uh, breaking these things down into smaller parts means you can combine them with other smaller parts and create a vast array of different components out of them. Um, a phrase that really annoys me is um, failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, it annoys me because people only tell you this after you've messed up. No one tells you this before you start a project. They always tell you after you've got it wrong. Um, but as annoying as that is, it's a very, very good phrase to sort of listen to. If you imagine building a house, um, you couldn't just turn up on day one with a load of bricks and build a house. Um, it would be fun, but you have to plan things. And it's the same with a big website. When I moved to Sky, I spent most of my time thinking about how I was going to build the website. Um, as developers, we want to dive in and code straight away, because that, that's the fun thing. That's what we get paid to do. That's why we chose these jobs, because we enjoy building. But unfortunately, we have to plan things. Um, so to carry the house analogy further, uh, I do think there are strong parallels between building houses and building websites, and a lot of it comes down to the common sense approach. Um, you know, you'll have your architect will draw out plans, and then your brickie will come in and they'll build the house. You know, it ha things have to happen in a certain order. Um, if we look at houses compared to websites, it might take months or weeks to build a house, but you'd hope that it's around for years to come. Uh, it's the same with a website. It might take you six weeks to build a client's website, but hopefully that website will last them two, three, four years. Another thing that they share in common is um, you might have a lot of people working on a house who all have different jobs. You'll have your laborers, you'll have plumbers, you'll have joiners. Um, these people all do very different jobs, but they all work well together. They don't have to do each other's jobs, but they have to be aware of everyone else. It's the same with websites. You'll have designers, programmers, DevOps guys. These people all have separate jobs, but they all work well together. Uh, and this is like sort of breaking things down again into different roles and different parts of, uh, of building, a, building a site. Uh, another really sort of interesting sort of a comparison, I think, is um, just because some people built a house or a website doesn't mean they're the people looking after it. If you imagine your house that you live in, it might have been built in, say, the 50s. Um, if you want to get an extension put on the house, you won't get the same builders who come out and do it. Um, it's the same with a lot of websites. Uh, you might build a website for a client, then move to another agency. So someone else at your company has to take on that role. Um, the client might take the website elsewhere. It's sad, but it happens. So the client might take their website to another agency. So just because you built a website doesn't mean you're going to be the guy looking after it. Um, some sort of further sort of comparisons we can make come back to this breaking things down. Um, I couldn't build a house. But again, this common sense approach, I've got roughly an idea of what order you might build a house in. Um, you have to start with your foundations. You have to put something down that you can build the house on. Uh, where a website's concerned, this could be your reset or normalize.css if you use that. That has to come first. Uh, then you have your structure, the walls of the house, the roof. You can't put the walls up before you've, before you've put the foundations down. Uh, it's the same with uh, building a website. You know, you've got to have your foundations down before you can use a grid system to build your layout. Uh, then we've got fittings. Now, I don't know if fittings is the right word, but I'm not sure what the right word actually is. This is like um, window frames, door frames, uh, staircases. 
you can't put a window in if there's no wall to put it in. So you have to put these in after your sort of structure. Uh, it's the same with the website, you know, after you've put your grid system up, after you've built the page structure, fill it with your components, your different modules. Uh, on top of that, we lay the decoration. In a house, this might be wallpaper. Uh, on a website, this is the design, this is the look and feel. And finally, have ornaments. In a house, this might be a canvas on the wall. Um, could be a vase on a shelf. Uh, for a website, this is things like uh, takeovers and themings. Uh, you know, when YouTube have a special logo for Christmas Day, that's like a, a skin. That's the last thing that goes on the website. That's the top layer. Now, of course, just because we put them together in this order, it doesn't mean they have to be built in this order. I mean, your ornaments might get built before your house gets built, but um, they have to be put together in a certain order. If you build sort of a, a pattern library, a component library, you're probably building your fittings before you're building your grid system. But the way you put them together has to happen in a certain order. And again, this is the concept of breaking things down. By breaking things into natural sort of uh, layers, we can add things and take things away um, in, in sort of, uh, well, yeah, in layers. We can peel things back. We can leave things out. We can add extra things in. Uh, this is an image I found that kind of really nicely illustrates this point. Here we've got three more or less identical buildings. The one on the left is, is barely even started. It's got some structure up there. Um, the middle one, you know, it's, it's nearly finished. It just needs some, some windows put in. And the, the third one, it is finished. Here we can see this concept of layers in, in buildings. And we can apply that same concept of layering to how we build websites. Uh, this isn't going to be a very code-heavy talk, I'm afraid. I don't think many people could stand on a stage and tell you exactly how to code something, because there, there are too many different ways to, uh, to build a website. What I think people can do, myself included, is advise and sort of uh, you know, tell you what I've done before in the hope that you can take it further and, and do your own thing with it. So there won't be much code in this, uh, in this talk, I'm afraid. But um, here's a quick snapshot of uh, one of the CSS directories we use at Sky. Um, you might notice, uh, if anyone's familiar with Inuit, um, it's got a similar kind of looking directory structure. So what we've got is a, a variables file. This holds you know, brand colors, font sizes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, then this gets picked up by an aluminium directory. Aluminium is what we call our in-house framework. Uh, aluminium contains a, a generic directory. This contains our normalized. This contains basic sort of um, foundation level stuff. Then we've got base objects and GUI stuff. These are the, these are the layers. So the GUI, the GUI directory is the, the, uh, the theming, the skins, uh, the ornaments. Base and objects are sort of uh, interchangeable kind of um, you know, components that can have different designs laid on top of them. But here we've got, again, this concept of breaking things down. And, and working like this allows us at Sky to quickly spin out different variations of things. We could omit the GUI layer completely. We could drop another GUI layer on top of what we've got and make a completely different looking website. Uh, in fact, that's what we do, because Sky have many different products. Um, the GUI layer for us contains product-specific styles. So you might have a, a largely blue website. Um, yeah, you could swap out for a largely red website to, to very, very, very simplify the process. Uh, all this gets wrapped up into style.scss, so we use SAS, and that gets spat out to whatever sort of product-specific style sheet we're working with. Um, and again, it's this concept of just breaking things down. Uh, if this sounds sort of remotely familiar, uh, it's very similar to how um, Jonathan Snoop works with SMAX. Um, SMAX, Scalable Modular Architecture for CSS. Uh, it's a fantastic bit of writing. It's a fantastic bit of work. It's one of the best things I've certainly read in years um, concerning front-end development. Uh, Jonathan and I have actually set up a promo code. Um, he picked it, so if you're going to laugh, like, laugh now. You're a wizard, Harry. Um, that will get you, I think, 10 or 25% off the book. So it's a fantastic ebook. I think you can buy a printed book as well. Um, I'll leave that up for a second if you want to scribble that down. Um, save a bit of money off the book. It's well worth reading. I absolutely love it. It's one of the best things I've read, like I say, in, in years. Uh, so there's a small promo code for you guys there. All right, then. More analogies. Um, who here is eating at Subway? You know, the Subway sandwich. Yeah, not many. Is Subway not a big thing in Germany? Yeah? Maybe I just can't see the hands. Or maybe you've all got good taste. Um, so, yeah, Subway. If you think about Subway, um, they have taken the concept of breaking things down to, to food. You go to a Subway, you don't get offered a sandwich. I mean, you can do, but you get offered all the ingredients. And the beauty of this is you can pick and choose exactly what bits you want. You can pick and choose 
more onion, uh, less tomato, more meat. Um, and this concept of breaking things down applied to food means that you can make almost any sandwich you could possibly want. Uh, a statistic I read a few years ago, and I've, never been able, I've not been able to find it since, some guy worked out that you could build over a million combinations of sandwich at Subway just because they've broken things down so granular. Um, you can build almost any sandwich you want, over a million combinations. I've not been able to find the source of the uh, statistic for you, I'm afraid. But, um, you know, that's incredible, and that's just this concept of breaking things down. This is what we should do with all our, any code we write. We should break it down to the smallest component part that we can combine with other small parts to create a vast array of different things. And in doing this, we'll find that we are sort of adhering to what's called the single responsibility principle. Um, this is a computer science term that has been around since since forever. It's a really, for me, it's, it's beautiful in how simple it is. Um, the single responsibility principle basically states that everything should do one job and one job only, but it should do that one job very well. If you think back to your Subway sandwich, uh, cheese is really good at being cheese, but it's crap at being chicken. But it doesn't have to be chicken. It's the single responsibility principle. Um, you know, carrot is, carrot's only job is to be carrot. You can't have a go at carrot for not being tomato because its single responsibility is to be carrot. Uh, and again, it's this combination, this idea of combining these tiny parts. And uh, the single responsibility principle is the basis of Unix. Now, um, I was chatting with some guys over lunch, um, Jeremy and Brad and, and so on, and uh, we were talking about the command line. I really love the command line. I'm, I'm new to it, so I can't really speak with much confidence. But um, the command line teaches you a lot about the importance and value of the single responsibility principle. If we take a quick example, this is, a, this is something that I've actually written before. This is a, a thing that I have used. Uh, this simple command finds all the files in the current directory um, with PNG in the file name, and it, it lists them sort of reverse sorted by month. And the way we achieve this is by tying together or piping three commands. The ls command, its job is literally just to list things. Its single responsibility is to list something. We can pipe that into grep whose only single responsibility is to search for things, and we're searching for the string PNG. Then we take the result of that and pipe that into sort, and we can sort that by month and reversed. Now this, for me, is just, it's just so simple, but so clear and so beautiful that you can, you can imagine the combination of things you can do with these kinds of commands. This is the single responsibility principle at play, and this is what Unix systems are built on. Another example, um, we can list all the currently running processes and, and search for any SSH processes uh, on our machine. We do this by using ps, the process command. And we pipe that again into grep, the searching tool, but this time we're searching for SSH. So this is using grep a second time in a completely different scenario, um, but it's the exact same command. So by having these things doing one thing and one thing only, we can pick and choose and create different commands that do very, very different tasks. We've got two completely different jobs there, but both share the grep command. Uh, it's a really sensible way of working. So if we quickly recap on all that, um, the point I'm making is break everything down into tiny little chunks. Um, make sure everything's got a single responsibility, but make sure that responsibility doesn't stray. Make sure everything sticks to doing one job well. Uh, this allows us to add and combine and sort of uh, and take away little things, and we can, we can build such a, a vast array of resulting components just because we, we've broken things down so far. Uh, and carry this through to all the code you write. Uh, quick example, we have two lists here. Uh, this is a completely made up example as well. Um, the both share the base class of list, which considering it's on a list is probably quite redundant. But you know, th th there's a two common traits between these two snippets of HTML. The top one is a list of products. It also has a, has a class of special offers. Uh, it has a class of is sortable and a class of is sorted. So from that we can kind of glean that Okay, we're listing a series of products that are also on special offer. So perhaps we're listing those by um, cheapest to most expensive. Um, each one of those classes carries its own single responsibility. Uh, the bottom one, very similar, it's a list, but this time it's a list of stores. And we can see that this list of stores is ordered by proximity. And although it is sortable, it currently isn't sorted. We could probably list this, uh, sort this list, sorry, by um, how close it is to our postcode, how close it is to you know, uh, a certain city center. Uh, this is a way of writing CSS so that you can add these little single responsibilities in your markup to scale things quite nicely. 
um, just by adding more things on, you can expand the role of a piece of markup to do a lot more stuff. So of course this means using more classes. Um, if something has to do three jobs, it only makes sense that it has three hooks attached to it. Um, you could wrap it all up into one ID, for example, but it'd be very cumbersome. It wouldn't be very reusable. You wouldn't be adhering to the single responsibility principle. Um, a lot of people don't like using more classes, but I, I honestly think it's, it's the way forward. Um, it is like the subway ingredients by having lots of things you can combine. Um, you know, you can, you can use classes to facilitate this perfectly. It's very uh, suitable for the single responsibility principle. Um, it also allows you to keep your CSS file size right down. Uh, the fact you're recycling more code means you're writing less of it. Uh, it means you, there's less code bloat. So now, whenever I tell this to a developer, whenever I say this to anyone, they always tend to complain about the fact that I'm using more classes in their markup. And one of the most common complaints is more classes means more to maintain. And of course, it, it kind of does. It means more HTML to maintain, but like, I, I always have a few things to say about that. Firstly is that HTML is really simple to work with. Um, changing a dozen classes across several files, you can use a global find and replace for that. You can't automate refactoring CSS. I have lost entire days, like full entire working days to refactoring bad CSS. Um, but I did a bit of work the other week, and I, I timed it for this talk. I, um, this, this bit of work I had to do involved changing a series of classes across a, across a load of views. And uh, it took me 12 minutes. Now, like I said, I have lost full days to refactoring CSS. Um, 12 minutes to change a few classes. It kept my CSS down. I didn't have to touch any more CSS. Um, you, know, you can use command line tools. Um, grep, the search tool. Um, so the process I took was I just ran grep of my entire code base, found the classes I needed to work with, uh, opened all those up in my text editor of choice, and did a global find and replace. And that's it, job done. It's so quick. Uh, and it's much more fun, oh sorry, it's much easier, much more uh, preferable than, uh, than refactoring CSS. I hate refactoring other people's CSS. Um, the other question, or the other thing I sort of pose is, um, can you not dry your markup out? Like, why are there so many classes repeated? Could you make better use of includes? Could you make better use of templating? Um, we always talk about drying out our CSS, but can we not dry out our markup as well? Um, so yeah, well, a, a templating language which spits these classes out for you could, could uh, ease the load. The final thing is it's, it's your job. I always get really baffled when a developer tells me that they have to maintain code. It's like, well, well yeah. Like, I don't know what you're expecting. Um, a developer who doesn't like maintaining code probably shouldn't be a developer. Uh, it's your job to maintain code, and to think you won't have to is kind of naive. Um, embrace ways to make it easier. So I've started learning more command line type stuff. Um, it can be really easy to change code if you, if you need to. So embrace ways of doing it. It's your job, and it's going to happen. There's no point shying away from it. Um, make sure that you're changing markup, which is nice and fast, rather than having to refactor tangled style sheets. So um, that's kind of the ethos that I take behind scaling CSS. Um, move the work from the style sheets to the markup a little more. Um, split everything out, adhere to the single responsibility principle. Like I say, the single responsibility principle is, is years old, and it's proved itself time and time again to be a useful thing in, um, in, in computer science. We could do to borrow some of those principles and apply it to our CSS, our front-end code. Um, so every talk I give uh, on CSS features this word, and it's the one word I struggle to say. Specificity, all right? Now, specificity is a horrible, horrible thing. Um, specificity is the only reason we have important. Everyone hates using important, right? Well, that's because of specificity. It's always important. See, I can't say it. <laughs> I'll let Christian shout out. He seems to know how to do it. Um, but yeah, keeping specificity low is, uh, is really key. If you're going to scale an application, you want to keep all your CSS classes, all your sort of um, selectors nice and sort of low on the specificity spectrum. Um, so classes are a nice low specificity selector that, as we've discussed, lend themselves really well to the single responsibility principle, nice granular selectors. Um, I always get told off for this one as well, is never use IDs in CSS. Um, use them in markup, use them in JavaScript, but don't use IDs in CSS. And this is another one that really um, divides the community. Um, a lot of people tell me this when I say don't use IDs in CSS. I hear this a lot of the time. Um, 
my answer to that would be, if it's really important to you to see that something's u uh, unique, if it, was really, if it helps you out that much, then do something like this. Uh, that's perfectly valid markup. You can style that through CSS. Um, you know, we can see there that, yeah, we've got a div with a class of site header. It's got a hash in there. We presume that's going to be unique. Uh, there is literally no good that comes from using IDs. By introducing a specificity heavyweight, uh, all your other selectors can't touch it. It becomes really difficult to get yourself out of specificity nightmares, which is why you have to use important, which is why the next guy uses important and the next guy, and all of a sudden, you're looking at a style treat which is 50% important. Um, so yeah, keep specificity low. It's quite an easy thing to do. It's, it's a real quick win. Just avoid using IDs, avoid nesting selectors, you know, um, avoid qualifying selectors. Um, there are some real quick wins when it comes to scaling CSS, and the quickest one I can give you is just keep specificity low at all costs. And again, if you need to ensure that something appears to be unique from the markup, then, then use something like this. Um, so I really love music. I can't make music. I don't know anything about music, but I love listening to music. And uh, this is a quote that I heard quite recently, which um, really struck a chord with me. Um, this is so true. Music is the space between the notes. Every song you listen to is made up of the same musical notes. But it's the way they're ordered and the, way, the, the amount of them. And you know, it's just the way they're put together that makes songs different. Uh, and this, again, is like the Subway sandwich. Every ingredient's the same old ingredient, but it's the order you put them together, the quantity, uh, the notes you leave out. They all shape the kind of the song that you're going to hear. Um, so this is a really nice thing to sort of try and apply back to, uh, to CSS. A lot of what I do is apply sort of other concepts to CSS to try and learn from other things to see how we can do our jobs better. And I think this is a really good one. Um, CSS is really boring. I'm amazed that I've found you know, work for five years in CSS because it's so boring. Like, it's the most sort of dull, simple, basic synth float left, you know, color red. It's, the most, it's almost offensively simple. It's so boring. Um, but where I find CSS interesting is the space outside the braces. So the order we put musical notes together, uh, I find it interesting. You know, we've got things that adhere to the single responsibility principle now. How are these things going to play together? You know, for me, CSS is the space outside the braces. Um, this includes stuff like specificity. Oh, cannot say it. Keeping specificity low is outside the braces. It happens outside the braces. Uh, naming conventions. The order in which you write your CSS. You know, we, we covered the foundations, then the structure, and so on. This is all stuff that happens outside the braces that is key to scaling CSS. It doesn't matter if you used color red or color hash F00. It's, it's the same thing. That's not going to affect how well your application will scale. It's the things you do outside the braces that will affect that. So I mentioned naming conventions. Something that I'm a huge proponent of is, um, is BEM. I absolutely love BEM. Um, it stands for Block Element Modifier, and it was invented by the guys at Yandex, the Russian search engine. And the flavor of BEM that I use is actually um, one that's been honed by Nicholas Gallagher, if you've heard of him. He is Mr. Normalized CSS. He works for Twitter. A uh, real clever chap. Uh, I use sort of his flavor of BEM. And, um, and basically, yeah, a block is a discrete component, so um, a contact form, perhaps. An element is something that makes up that component as a whole. So it might be the submit button. That's an element of the contact form. And then you have modifiers. These are things that change the component. So perhaps the contact form, you know, it might be how that looks um, on a public holiday, you know, when no one can answer the email straight away. Maybe they style the form differently. Um, to take a human example, then, a person is a type of block. It's a discrete component. It's a complete thing. Uh, people have hands, so we denote this by two underscores. This is an element of a person. Person underscore underscore hand means this is an element of a person. And of course, we have different types of people. We have tall, short, fat, thin, male, female. And to denote these variations, these modifiers, we use two dashes. Now, if we're going to use more classes in our markup, it's really important that we have a sort of sane and nice-to-use naming system. Uh, a little example, like a, a blob of HTML here. We've got, uh, we've got loads of classes there, but it's really difficult to see how they relate to one another. Um, does the widget class have anything to do with the body class? Um, does the heading class have anything to do with the media class and so on? It's really hard to tell just from looking at that market what anything does here. If we're going to use more classes in our HTML, which I honestly believe we should be doing, we need to make them a little easier to work with. 
So um, to answer our questions, which classes relate to which, we can use the BEM me methodology of, of naming things. So now we can see that the IMG class is an element of media. Uh, the heading class is actually an element of widget. So just from looking at this market, we can see really quickly what everything does. If, uh, if someone comes along and says, can you get rid of the widget styling, we know exactly which classes to delete here. We don't have to go and search through the CSS to try and find out what everything does. It tells us very explicitly and clearly what these classes do. So if we're going to use more of them, then you know, I think we should probably make sure we use a, a naming methodology which, which helps us. I personally love BEM. Uh, there are others, I presume. Uh, Smacks has some sort of low-level um, naming conventions, but they're a really useful thing to have to communicate to other developers. Like I said, um, you might not be the guy looking after the website. It might not be your agency looking after the website. So you need to write things clearly for the person that is. Um, another thing that continually sort of divides the community is the idea of preprocessors. Now, I'm not going to tell you you should use X, Y, Z preprocessor. You know, uh, I use SAS and I love SAS. Um, for a few years, I sort of avoided preprocessors, and um, I feel really naive for having done so. I finally picked up SAS about nine months ago um, when I rebuilt Inuit.css, and I've not looked back. It's just it's a fantastic way of aiding your workflow, especially if you want to scale a website. If we're splitting all our code down into little single responsibilities, it's nice to have those contained in their own separate file. Um, because they're in their own separate file and we include them, we use at import, for example, um, we can rejig, like we can move a couple of lines up and down. We can completely restructure our entire style tree. Just from nudging a couple of lines, we can completely re-architect our entire application style tree. Um, it allows us to experiment really quickly. It allows us to uh, juggle source order around to perhaps circumvent specificity headaches. Um, and because we're all in individual files, we can easily include or exclude things at will. If you stop using a certain component, there's no point deleting a CSS. Just comment out its uh, include. You know, it keeps your CSS file size down. Um, and it's a really nice way of working. And also, it makes your code drier. Um, not necessarily just your production code, but holding sort of um, hex values in, in variables. If you're working on a big website, you don't want to have to remember the brand color or the, you know, the link color. You don't want to have to remember that. You've got better things to keep on your mind. So um, you know, using variables to sort of uh, ease your workload, ease what you have to remember. So I honestly think preprocessors are a really valuable tool. Again, if you're not comfortable, you don't want, to, don't want to use them, you can easily get by without. But like I said, I felt quite naive when I'd stepped into the world of SAS and I realized what I'd been missing out on. Um, back to the idea of other developers sort of inheriting your website. Um, one constant pain point I have at work, and, um, and in general, really, I'm sure everyone does, no one ever seems to write enough comments. The amount of times I open a style sheet and I'm just like, like I don't know what that does. I don't touch it. I, I, there's too many importants in there, and it just looks horrible. You know, a simple comment can explain way more than you'd imagine. Um, document anything that isn't immediately obvious from the code. Uh, explain what the code's doing, why it's doing that, and how it's doing it. Uh, this is the example. Oh, sorry. This is an example of the kind of uh, comment formatting I use. It's a, a little like a doc block. If you've heard of doc block formatting. Um, it's, it's a real simple but useful way of writing comments. Um, the idea of the numbered list, again, is something I pinched from Nicholas Gallagher. Um, you know, if you've got any particular declarations that do something a little unusual, um, you can write about those specifically by numbering it and talking about it. Um, this aids other developers. You, know, you might go on holiday for two weeks, and uh, someone might have to take over. And she can read your comments and see exactly what you intended to, to happen. Um, so these are sort of behind the scenes ways of scaling websites. The amount of redundant CSS that gets written because people don't understand what's already there is mind-blowing. You know, just by writing comments and allowing people to understand what they're already working with means that you can keep your CSS file size way down. Uh, another phrase that I used to hear all the time growing up when my mum wanted me to clean my bedroom was a clean house, clean mind. And, uh, and having grown up uh, and sort of <coughs> working with code day in, day out, it's a really valuable sort of phrase to keep on your mind. Um, if you're going to be working with a big website, you know, lots of CSS for maybe six months, 12 months, um, it's important to keep that code base tidy. I think a lot of problems with working with code are purely psychological. If you look at a, a nasty, sort of messy style sheet, you instantly want to just shut your computer down and run outside. Um, by keeping your code clean, it becomes, it just feels nicer to work with. Um, 
Things like consistent formatting, you know, set rules and stick to them. Loads of white space, comments again. Um, clean code is nicer for people to work with. Um, and bad code sets a precedent. As soon as you see bad code, you kind of don't feel as bad of, about writing bad code yourself. Um, you know, if I pop open a style sheet and it's a complete mess, then I don't have too much trouble sort of thinking, well, do you know what, they've done it, so will I. It was like that when I got here kind of thing. Um, so by just keeping clean, you can make bad code look good. And conversely, you can make good code look bad. If we take a look at this really simple example. That's completely valid. Nothing's invalid there. Nothing will, you know, break. Nothing's wrong with that. It just looks really ugly. Um, just by formatting that a little nicer, it becomes a lot nicer to work with. Um, it's the exact same CSS. It will render exactly the same, but instantly a developer will feel a lot more, more comfortable working with that. Um, bad code does set a precedent. Bad code allows people to think, well, do you know what? Someone else didn't care. Why should I care? Um, and I find that happens on big projects. Now, it's all well and good saying, you know, keep your code clean, but sometimes, especially over a longer project, things will start to split at the seams. You know, things start to creak, and, and people do sort of lose sight of it. So, um, so bad code does happen, and I'm guilty of it. Everyone's guilty of it. Um, you know, you have to write a quick hack. You know, it happens, especially like if you work on a project. I've just finished a project which lasted uh, uh, sort of just over 12 months. You know, by the end of it, you're just like, the site's got so big that you've lost sight of what you actually care about. So it's important to go back and tidy things up. Um, if someone asks you for a new feature, the new feature might take two and a half days. But just say three days, because you can spend an extra half day tidying things up, refactoring things. Uh, if you work on a product, or you work in-house, where you've got, um, you perhaps work agile, or you work in sprints, uh, one thing we do at Sky is we have half a day every now and again just to tidy up, sort of, uh, tidy up our code base. One thing that baffles me is um, if your product is a website, you can't afford bad code. Like if your product is code, like you cannot let that get messy. Um, your developers will get pissed off. They won't want to work with it. It'll get slow. It'll creak. Um, adding new features will take longer. You know, it's um, it's important to keep you know, sort of these this idea in mind of going back to tidy up your style sheets, tidy up any code. A uh, thing I wrote about recently. Um, the idea of a shame.css. I don't know if anyone read this. It seemed to such a simple idea that really took off. I was amazed that people bought into this idea so much. But um, it's a simple style sheet, or like a, like a smaller file in your main style sheet, your main CSS directory, which houses your sort of hacky CSS. The CSS you didn't want to have to write, but you had to. Um, you know, it's that kind of stuff where you feel really, like you feel nasty writing it. You just feel like you need to go get a shower, but you had to do it because you know, there was a bug, and you had to fix something. Um, so this is like a self-documenting to-do list in your half-day sort of uh, sprint time, your half-day sort of um, bug-fixing time. You've instantly got a file full of things to look at, and you can go sort of say, well, I'll fix that, I'll fix that. And um, by keeping it all in its own file, you can easily see who did what and why and when. Now, it's called shame.css, but I don't really mean it to be quite so, uh, so brutal. Um, you know, you can, if you leave a comment in there saying, look, there was a bug on the live site. I had to use this to get it working. Um, you know, but I'm going to fix it, and this is how I would imagine I will fix it. Um, you, know, you can see easily who did what and when and talk to them. And this, is, this, is, you know, this helps you keep your code base tidy by acknowledging the mucky bits, by acknowledging the bits that are hacks. It allows you to keep, uh, keep an eye on where things are going wrong. Um, but the final bit of advice I'd give is um, like, don't stress. Nothing's going to work perfectly the first time. Um, I've made mistakes at Sky. I continue to make mistakes at Sky. Uh, and everyone does. I, I worry that people often get on stages and tell you, like, oh, yeah, I'm awesome, and I know exactly what I'm doing. Like, no one knows what they're doing, really. Everyone's, to an extent, winging it a little bit. Um, so don't stress, you know? Try your best. You can't do better than your best. Um, and it's just code. Like, if your biggest worry at the moment is CSS or code, then I think you should count yourself quite lucky. If the biggest thing you've got to worry about is a nasty style sheet, then you're doing better than most people. You know, just, just do what you can. Um, you know, keep, keep trying, keep experimenting. Um, read articles, write articles. You know, if you find something that really works, share that with people. Because uh, I'm still finding my feet. I'm still trying to work things out. I'm still making things up. And, uh, and everyone's doing the same. So if we all band together, um, like the world of front-end architecture and, and certainly CSS architecture is quite a a new thing that people are looking at. And, uh, and we, all, we need all the help we can get, I guess. You know? So don't stress, you know, experiment, find things to do, uh, and share the results of that. 
So to sort of wrap up then, um, any CSS we write, particularly on a bigger project, uh, we should try and break it down into like a single responsibility principle style snippets. Make sure every class you write has uh, you know, one responsibility, and it does that thing very, very well. Um, one of the quickest wins for scaling CSS is just keep specificity down. Avoid IDs. If you need to flag something as unique, pick a naming convention that will allow you to do that. Um, you've all heard, keep it simple, stupid. Kiss, right? Uh, I'm like a professional dumbass. Like, I like to keep everything really simple. I, I don't like complexity. I don't like anything being unnecessarily difficult. So, um, so keeping specificity alert is a really easy rule for me to follow. You just don't use an ID. What a simple rule that is. Uh, run a tight ship. You know, try and write in-house style guides. Try and agree on a way to write CSS. I mean, you'll never agree. I mean, I'm sure if you've tried it at your place of work, trying to get every developer to decide, well, is it two spaces or four, or is it tabs? You know, people will never agree, but you know, try and find some common ground so you can keep your code base nice and lean and, uh, and, and well documented. And like I said, just keep on keeping on. Um, everyone's still experimenting with things. Um, you know, if you find a way that works better than using classes, then yeah, please write that kind of thing up. Get on stage and, and share what you're doing. Uh, it's a really interesting sort of uh, field at the moment, front, front end architecture. Uh, and I'm going to keep plodding along. I'm always thinking of different approaches to take. Um, my, my way of working is basically if a programmer's doing it, try and steal it and make it work for CSS. You know, that's where the single responsibility thing came from. Uh, object oriented CSS, you know, that's stealing things from programmers. Um, so, yeah, just keep trying to learn, keep trying to build new things and approach things in new ways and, and share whatever you can, really. Uh, so that's me wrapping up. I've um, got the links for Smax and BEM up there again. Um, like I said, the, um, the promo code was, you're a wizard, Harry, which, which is just embarrassing. Um, I'll have to have a word with Jonathan about that one. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it from me. Thank you very much. <laughs>